we're gonna take some really old technology, combine it with some new technology, and make some really accurate parts. What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool, back here again for Practical Machinist. Today on Shop Talk, we're gonna be taking you through how we make some vein pumps, just like these. Make sure you check this one out. But before we do, make sure you like and subscribe below if you wanna see more videos. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so today on Shop Talk, we're gonna be going through a job we have run multiple times here at Lakewood Machine and Tool. Um, this is an interesting job because it's one that we have done multiple different ways over the years and has gone from a job that used to take a lot of time and effort and money and resources to one that turned out to be a very, very good money maker because we've adapted as we went along. So the part I'm gonna be showing you guys today is this one here. It is made of ductile iron. You can see that it is about four inch diameter and just over two inches long. I think it's about two and a half. I don't have a caliper here on me. But these are made from ductile iron. Um, we make approximately 20 to 30 of these in a run, depending on the order from our customer. But this is an interesting job. A um, little backstory on these. This job originally we got about five years ago and it was almost a purely wire EDM job. So to back up a little bit here, I'm gonna take you through the process we run through when we make these parts. So to start off, we get ductile iron in, in about eight, it's two of these. So eight inch-ish, about this long, in four and a half inch diameter. To start them, we put them inside our lathe. We have a straight turning lathe, a Haas ST20. So we pop these in, we machine half of it, flip it around, machine the other half. So we take it to diameter and we face one end. We also put the bore through. After we've done that, and there's some really tight tolerances here, so we need to really stay on top of it when we're running them in the lathe to make sure everything comes out right. But after we've done that, we used to take them to the saw, saw them in half, and then put them back in the lathe. Now, we actually run them on that second up and part them off. This is a bit of a sketchy operation. Uh, it took us a little bit to get it dialed in, especially because you're dropping a heavy part into the machine. Um, we use a bucket as a part catcher to keep it from damaging the ways. Never had any issue with it so far. After that, it goes on to our wire machine. We have a Sodic AQ325 wire machine here. So we put it on this fixture right here. This fixture was originally made, as you can see, with all the slots already in it. We used to actually wire cut the keyway. So there's a keyway in here that has to be a very precise uh, measurement, I guess, because it drives the entire vein pump. So to keep everything super tight, so our tolerances on these slots are you know, within one or two thou, depending on the depth or the width. We used to actually put this in the wire machine and wire cut that slot for the keyway and all the slots at the same time. For those of you, you guys who know wire EDM, this was a very accurate way of doing things, but it was also a very expensive way of doing things. Um, you know, if that keyway takes, you know, a couple minutes to cut, these slots, when we're talking about a part that is that big and that thick, takes a really, really long time to cut. Most importantly, guys, wire EDM, you have your roll of wire as a consumable, not to mention, um, the resin in the tank, not to mention the filters, not to mention the contact plates. There's a lot of consumable items on a wire machine. Wire is just one of them. A roll of wire, the size we get, costs around 110 to 120 bucks. We used to get approximately two of these rotors out of one roll of wire. Not to mention the fact we might get two parts a day. It took, you know, four to five hours to cut apart. So, you, you know, you put one in in the morning, usually switch it over at night and you might, if someone was working a little late, get another one in to cut overnight. But then you'd have to have a half roll of wire there. It was a confusing thing to do. It got the job done. We had it priced appropriately that it made money, but it wasn't a very efficient way to do things. Now we put it on this fixture and we just cut that keyway. So when it's done, it comes out without these slots and just has the keyway in it. That keyway allows us to put it on a mandrel. As you can see the part behind me here, guys, there is a key on this mandrel we put inside 
the uh, VF5 here on our fourth axis. This is really, really handy because it allows us to rotate this part and cut one slot at a time. Now to talk about old technology guys, some of you guys who are new to the trade may have never used one of these. This is a slitting saw. This is some very, very old technology, but it does have its uses. The reason why a slitting saw is so handy in this application is that those slots have a fairly tight tolerance on them, but they're also very narrow. Um, when you're dealing with a method of cutting the slots, you could theoretically use something like a 1 8 ml or 3 16 ml that's very long and step it down. The problem you're gonna get into is deflection, chip evacuation, um, you pretty much be doing a full diameter cut, you blow out cutters, you need to stay on top of making things, making sure things don't wear out. With a slitting saw, you actually get around a lot of that. Um, we do this in two different saw passes. So to start out, this is our, this is our finisher, but we use two of almost the exact same saw. So we use one saw through, it usually goes in two passes, one up a little bit and one down a little bit from center, center in order to cut that slot almost to size and almost to depth. Afterwards, we put in a finish saw. And just so you guys understand the consumables in this compared to a wire machine, we have used this same roughing sledding saw on probably three to four runs of these. And generally we can get two different runs of 20 parts out of one finish saw. That's how good the tool life on these are if you have your feeds and speeds dialed in correctly. Incorrectly, not incorrectly. If you have it dialed correctly, it goes very quickly and very accurately. Now this is just an off the shelf slitting saw. Um, it's carbide tipped, which is nice, but you know, the body is just high speed steel. You can get these and we're almost at the point where we're doing this job enough with insertable carbide. Um, some tooling manufacturers make really, really cool ones. So everywhere here where you see a tooth, there's actually a carbide insert. Uh, they're very, very handy because they do have very good rigidity. And once you get the speed and feed dialed in, the performance of it is very, very good. We went from, you know, when we first were setting this up, we would get the roughing passes done on these rotors in approximately, you know, an hour. Once we got that dialed in properly, we're looking at maybe half an hour or less for the roughing pass and even less than that for the finish pass. Once we've done this, we put all our, uh, our slots in, we have a set of go, no go gauges. So for you guys who are new to the trade, this is a really handy way to check things quickly. We do a full QA on these, but before they even come out of the machine, we have a go and a no go gauge. So our go gauge, we wanna make sure it goes in because these need to be very straight. The tolerance is tight. Go gauge needs to go all the way to the bottom. Nice and easy way to check. You can see it goes in right to the bottom the whole way. These are ground. You know, we only use these one or two times and then we make new gauges if we have to because you know, we want to be very on top of this, but the go gauge goes in all the way. That shows us that it is within tolerance to the positive side, but the no go gauge does not go in. Um, this is handy to check because then we can know right away whether we have a problem. After that, once we've checked all these slots, the next operation in there is to put these little rads on the corners. You can see every corner here has a tiny little rad. I believe it's about 30 thou. So we use a solid carbide tool to go in and put all these rads in there on the machine before we take it out. You could, you know, theoretically try to uh, file these on or belt sand them on or something. Always, always, always go for consistency, guys. So we go ahead and we mill those on with a rad cutter. Afterwards, it's really important. These function at very high speed. Essentially, a little vein goes in each one of these. This thing sits in a housing and it spins very, very quickly in order to create pressure. If this thing is not within tolerance by the manufacturer's specs, bad things will happen. So we do take these for a full QC process. Um, we don't have a CMM. We just use a height gauge. We use micrometers, depth micrometers, um, to go make sure that every single part gets that full process done to make sure when we ship these out, if they say we actually number these two just with a marker, so that if one of our uh, customers, when they get these says, hey, this part is not within spec, we can actually go and compare that to our logs and say, hmm, everything looked good on our end, or hey, do you know what? Well, I mean, here's the thing, guys. If you're doing a full QC, you should never get that question asked. 
We've never had to go find them and see, hey, did we mess up the dimension? If you're doing proper QC, this is really redundant, but it's good to have, because then you can go to your customer and say, hey, do you know what? Here's our specs on it. Why don't you send it back? We can double check our specs. It just gives you an extra layer of protection. Because when you're dealing with things like this that can have some ca catastrophic failures, you always want to make sure you're covering yourself off. Um, this has been a job that has gone through here, like I said, multiple times. It's a job we probably run two to three times a year. So it's something that we're always iterating on and trying to make better as we go. Next up for these, I would say we're probably going to look at, like I said, getting some insertable uh, carbide slitting saws in here. I don't know if that's the term they actually use for them when you're dealing with a carbide insertable uh, slitting saw. I got to look into it, but it's a very, very handy thing to have. And if we can push our performance on these even higher, at the end of the day, it's just a higher margin. I can pay my guys more to run them. It's, it's better for everybody all around, right? Um, you have faster turnaround to get parts out the door. You have less time for setup. The more consistent you can make something, the better. Make sure you guys let me know in the comments below if you guys have run parts like these before. You know, we're not the only guys in the world who have manufactured vein pumps. So I'd be interested to know how you guys do them. I would also be interested to see if you guys have any tips for a guy like me who is looking to get into some more carbide insertable slitting saws. Thank you very much for watching guys. As always, make sure you like and subscribe below if you wanna see more videos. You take care.